Okay, go ahead and just start recording there and get off camera here. All right, uh, we are here with Mr. John Nichols. Uh, my name is Juan Concha with the Taos News. And we are conducting an interview for the series on prejudice and uh, systemic racism. And we're trying to break that down here in Taos for our community protect ourselves from it. And uh, we're gonna have uh, Mr. Nichols here just answer a few questions, share some of his wisdom over the years with us. And uh, first question for you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nichols, does Taos suffer from systemic racism? Yeah. yeah. In, in what ways have you noticed? Um, there's a, uh, oh my God, I came here in, nine, in 1969 and uh, I remember uh, that people at the Pueblo were very poor, that Hispanic people were pretty poor also, uh, that businesses were mostly owned by new in-migrants, newer in-migrants, in you know, Anglos, that kind of stuff, um, controlling the, the, um, the economy. And uh, there was, um, uh, I had a lot of friends that would just sort of on Saturday nights get arrested by the cops and they'd call me and I'd come in and, you know, pay. There was no, um, uh, you know, legal things that you could do. It was just you pay 50 bucks or 30 bucks or something and they'd let people free, you know. And they were just arresting people for leaving the towels in and going to take a pee in the parking lot or something. Mm. And, um, but there was, it, there was a huge um, monetary discrepancy between basically Anglos who owned probably 70% of the businesses and uh, a few local Hispanics owned businesses. I think there were only three businesses owned by the Pueblo. At, at that time, you know, Tony Reyna and Sonny Spruce and, right. and maybe somebody else. And um, in my generation, there, there were lots of people who had um, been prohibited in the school system from speaking Spanish and especially from speaking Tiwa. You know, the people were punished, kids were punished for speaking Tiwa and Spanish in school. And I had a lot of friends who were Chicano, who were Hispanic, uh, Latinx, who, of my generation, who couldn't speak Spanish very well because their parents had been punished so much for not speaking English in school. And they wanted their kids to have opportunities in, you know, America. And so they had discouraged speaking Spanish at home and stuff like that. And um, there was also, uh, and I remember once um, uh, my wife wanted to build an orno, you know, an orno for making chicos and stuff. And Jerry Track was really good at doing that. Jerry Track made beautiful little clay pueblos and, 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 and stuff that she sold. And she could make really wonderful ornos. And I asked Jerry, I said, how much would it cost to build an orno? And Jerry told me, oh, whatever whatever you want to pay. And I said, no, Jerry, you're a craftsperson, you're an artist. What, what would you make, you know, to, to do this job? And uh, she just said, you know, she just said, whatever you're willing to pay. So I went around to um, 
people to people in, in, in galleries and stuff. And I said, what would a skilled artisan at the Pueblo receive as pay for building, you know, at Orno? And people kept telling me, and these were mostly Anglos, telling me, oh, you can get them to do it real cheap, right? And uh, I said, I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> And finally, I went to a couple of carpenters, builders, you know, and I said, what would a really good Finnish carpenter get, you know, per hour for doing a job? And they would tell me, oh, $35 an hour, or 40 or $50 an hour. And um, I went back to Jerry, and I said, Jerry, I'll pay you what, uh, what a good finished artisan would get for the, the craft and the job you're doing. And she was really shocked, you know, that, that, that I was trying to find a way to pay her what she was really worth, that, that I didn't want to take advantage of her. And um, I ran into that a lot here. I know Taos had a reputation of being a wonderful, happy town where three cultures get together in perfect harmony, right? And that's, that wasn't true. I mean, for me, it was a huge thing to be able to speak Spanish because I moved, I moved in the house in Upper Ranchitos first. And, and I could communicate. I could go to meetings and people wouldn't have to adopt English you know, in order to carry on the meeting. I'd, I'd be the only Anglo there. Okay. And uh, so they could they could talk in Spanish. And uh, I remember when I had friends at the Pueblo, probably my first friends in Taos were, the, were Jim Suazo and Jerry Track and her family and John Suazo and Juanita Dubray, Grandma Johnny, and all, all the people in their family. And uh, I said, I would really like to learn Tiwa too. And they said, no, we don't want you to learn our language, you know. We, we don't want people because they will just use it as a kind of cultural imperialism to, to denigrate, you know our language and stuff like that. I did, I did take an active fight in the return of Blue Lake. You know, I wrote articles, I was writing articles and that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of anti-Pueblo feeling. There were, there were, um, I forget, the New Mexico senator from down south, Anderson, Clinton P. Yeah. Anderson or something. They really fought, you know, the return of Blue Lake and stuff. And basically, white people were afraid that if the Taos Pueblo got back Blue Lake land, then on every every um, tribe and reservation in the United States would have a case for getting back their lands that had been stolen, right? But there was an awful lot of racial conflict and political conflict around that. And um, so... Okay. Um, well, for yourself, um, what, if any, forms of racism or prejudice have you experienced in Taos? Um, what form have I um, I can't think, you know, offhand. I have, I integrated really quickly, partially because I, I spoke Spanish and really got along with all my, and immediately, you know, became involved in the acequias and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Became a commissioner on the acequia and, and, and worked a lot with water rights and water struggles, that kind of thing. 
and um, I do remember that, that I um, had a girlfriend for about a year, uh, Marina Garcia, who was a singer, and she came from Cuesta. And Marina would sing at uh, La Cocina or different places in town. She was good. And she would always want to go out dancing afterwards or have a drink or something like that. And so we would go to, I don't know, Los Compadres or the uh, Holiday Inn or Indian Hills or stuff like that. And often I would get guff from, from you know, other people in the bar, you know, from Hispanic people sort of kidding me or being hostile or something like that for going out with Marina. And then Marina would ask me why, why didn't I stick up for her and fight, fight back? And I'd say, Marina, let's just go to another place or let's just leave. I'm, I'm not going to get in a bar fight, you know, over whatever jealousies are going down or, what, you know, that kind of thing. And I also know that my books, books that I've written, have, many people have really enjoyed and liked them, and other people um, don't like them. And they don't like the fact that, that an Anglo is writing books that also deal with a lot of, you know, most particularly Hispanic characters and feel that I'm exploiting that culture, right? You know, that uh, it brings to mind a, uh, I believe it was a KNME special that you were involved with where you were talking about, um, I think the guy asked you like where your mind was when you were writing a particular book. I think it was the, the 2016 one, the, the the top of the mountain one. Oh, on top of spring. Yeah, yeah and um, you were telling the reporter that um, you didn't necessarily write about things that you knew, but as a writer, you would want to write about things that you're interested in. So that way you can learn about them and, and uh -huh. draw your creativity from your learning experience. Right. So uh, that just calls out to mind you, you what you're saying right now about how you've immersed yourself in the community, had a popular girlfriend, yeah. some of the local guys obviously jealous that, yeah. you know. So but, yeah. But for the most part, I mean, I really loved Tales because in my family, my mother was French. But she was from Brittany in northern France. Okay. And they have a completely different language, a completely different culture from the French culture. Huh? And so often Brittany, you know, has trouble fighting the majority population, the French, and mm. there's a lot of conflict. And my mother, my um, grandfather, uh, also worked in Barcelona, Spain so that my mother spent much of her childhood going back and forth between France and Spain. So she spoke Spanish and she spoke French and she spoke English and she spoke German and, you know, Italian. Wow. And, uh, and my father spoke French and Russian and, you know, so I was brought up in multicultural areas. And, and, uh, and I've always felt that you know, we're, we're all much more alike than we are different, no matter where. I mean, whether it's in northern Vermont or rural Virginia or Brittany in, in northern France or, or Barcelona or in, in, in Spain. I have lots of first cousins. They, they were all raised pretty much Spanish. Their dad was, dad was French. But they grew up in Alicante, Spain, and uh, they uh, they all speak. You know, some of them are Spanish citizens. Some of them are they hold dual or triple passports. Huh. You know, for Spain and for France and, and for America because their mother was American. But they all one lives in Barcelona. Two of them live in Alicante, Spain. My favorite one lives in Madrid. 
And so I've had a lot of interaction in my lifetime with all kinds of different ethnicities and cultures and languages. And before I came here, I lived in New York City in, you know, in Italian Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican neighborhood, and then in the Ukrainian neighborhood. Ah. So. All right. Okay. So, um, now that we're getting back to that towards New York, that's good. That's good. Um, do you see any reflections of the past in the current state of civil unrest with the Black Lives Movement being kind of re-sparked, you know? remnants of like the civil civil rights movements and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Do you see any kind of resemblance between what's going on now versus what's going Absolutely. on then? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, mean, I was born in 1940. Okay. So I'll be 80 in a few weeks. I was born in July. And uh, um, I know I, I wasn't aware at three years old of the huge race riots in New York City. But I did spend all of, from 1964 until 1975, I was a major protester of the war in Vietnam. I participated in the civil rights movement, which had an awful lot of conflict and violence in it. The, you know, I marched against the war in Vietnam endlessly in New York City, you know, gatherings of 200,000 people in Central Park. And then we'd leave the park and take over Fifth Avenue, and then police would come, and everything you're watching on television today was happening then, and that was all throughout the 60s. There were huge um, riots around the country. I remember a big riot in Watts, Los Angeles, in 1965, where okay. maybe 30 people got killed. And in 1967, there was a big riot in Detroit. One of, one of the ones I remember, a huge riot in Detroit. And um, uh, 41 people got killed, I think. They actually had the National Guard and I think paratroopers in Detroit. 1968, when Martin, Martin Luther King was shot, there were riots all over America. You know, and, and kind of, and that was interesting because I was working on a novel in 1968, and um, it involved. Um, I had read a lot about um, uh, gas testing in Utah. I'm forgetting the the exact name of the gas that, that was tested, but it wound up drifting and killed whole sheep herds of either Navajo people or Ute people, you know, on a reservation in Utah. And so I was writing a book that dealt with a, a Native American kid and his friend who was an Anglo kid. They'd gone to school together back east, driving across America out to the southwest and uh, to, to the reservation. I think it was probably Ute, Ute Reservation, but I'm not sure, right? And um, I got on a bus to cross the country, I think on the day that Martin Luther King was shot. You know, I was in a bus crossing America, and I came to Colorado Springs and rented a little VW Beetle, because I was going to come down, I was going to talk to people at Taos Pueblo, I was going to talk to people you know, down along the Rio Grande that were Pueblo people, and I wanted to talk to um, people over in Fort Apache and San Carlos Reservation. I wanted to talk to Navajos, and I was going to drive to these different places and, and, and do interviews with people, like you're interviewing me now. And I was so upset by Martin Luther King getting shot, and then just riots everywhere, that I just drove that little car, listening to the radio, listening to the, you know, the disruptions everywhere in the country uh, after the horror of, King, of Martin Luther King's death, that I couldn't 
to stop and talk to people the way I had wanted to. Right. And I just wound up going all the way down to Douglas, Arizona, and then turning and going up through Fort Apache and San Carlos, and then, you know, going up, I don't know, through Sholo and places like that, and onto the Navajo Reservation, and going, I just, I couldn't stop and talk to people. I, I was so angry and so horrified. And uh, I went, you know, all, all the way over to Tuba City and up to Kanab, and then I just turned around and went back to Canyon City up to Colorado Springs, can got I, on the bus and went home. Can I ask you why? I mean, why? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean it to sound negative, but. Uh -huh. White guy driving across country, going to write this, you know, great novel, this piece of work. Right. Why concern yourself so much with something that seems so broad across the United States? Because I was interested in the book covering something that was really broad. You know, I was interested in dealing with, with uh, the. Um, I guess you would say the racism, uh, uh, everything that was universal. I mean, John Muir, a poet, once said that, uh, not a poet, an environmentalist, whatever, when you try and pick out anything by itself, you find it hitched to everything else in the universe. You know, the death of Martin Luther King certainly connected to how Native American people have been treated all around this country since the first Spaniards and the first pilgrims arrived, you know, on our shores. And uh, I was, this was, um, uh, uh, this was 1968, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And, and I was very political and very active in politics, and I just was so disturbed by the assassination of King and the resulting just havoc in a country that was already going through terrible havoc, ha havoc from the Vietnam War, and this includes the Vietnam people also. Yes, and, yes. I wasn't just worried about 58,000 Americans getting killed. I was just horrified that two and a half million Vietnamese got killed by us, you know. And I subsequently, when I came to Taos, I had a number of, of, of friends who had been in Vietnam, you know, who went to Vietnam, including, you know, a couple of, of um, Hispanic friends who had just tried to sabotage their units because they didn't feel they had any right to be killing people of color 8,000 miles away, you know. And I had several good friends, Hispanic and a friend from the Pueblo, who suffered serious PTSD from fighting in that war. And, um, Wow, man, so anyway, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Um, sort of a general question on this one. Uh, in your opinion, how well has President Trump responded to the current Black Lives Matter movement? Horribly. President Trump is, is just a, um, uh, well, let's see, let's not be just stupid. He's really, the, his, his, um, point of reference is to divide every divide and conquer. That's that's the way people have been kept down, you know, throughout the centuries. If you can divide and conquer the population, then you can control them. And Donald Trump has been a horrible um, person to be in the White House during the pandemic, during racial problems. He, he's a racist himself, he, he's, he's, God, I, um, 
I pretty much hated every president of the United States since I was a 10 or 11 year old kid and Dwight Eisenhower was president and the McCarthy period went down, you know, and then the Korean War and then the JFK and the Vietnam War and the Bay of Pigs attack Cuba. And, yep. and uh, Lyndon Johnson did some things domestically for the country, but then just accelerated the Vietnam War to the point where I hated Lyndon Johnson more than I've ever hated a president in my life. And then um, Richard Nixon took over. I certainly hated Richard Nixon more than I've hated anybody in my life, um, just for his invasions of Cambodia, and et cetera, et cetera. Although, I do admit that I was present at the celebration at the Pueblo when Blue Lake came back and Nixon did sign that. And I've always blessed Nixon for doing that. Yeah. And uh, he also did Clean Air and Water Act, you know, dangerous, Endangered Species Act and stuff. So nobody's all bad. I tested Ronald Reagan um, for everything he did to um, deregulate banks. He started really destroying the economic system in this country. And also the Contra War. I was in Nicaragua. 1983 in the middle of the Sandinista Revolution oh. and it was the most hopeful place I'd ever been in my life to see a whole country of people that had revolted and were trying to change their country from, you know, centuries of dictatorship, a lot of it under the United States, you know, um, and um, and then we, Reagan, formed the Contra War and stuff like that to invade Nicaragua and to um, help to destroy the Sandinista Revolution. Which, and the Sandinistas, I admit, shot themselves in the foot. And now they've got Daniel Ortega as the president. It's turned into a kind of a fascist, you know, mm -hmm. dictator when he was the hero of the revolution. I was down there. Oftentimes, more than not, isn't that the way it goes? Yeah. Change one, you know, form of oppression for another. Yeah. I mean, if you take Native American, the Native American plight, the ancestral trauma that was endured from the first colonists arriving, right. and then to go under the rule of the United States, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. There's that. History is brutal. There's no history that isn't brutal. You know, the history of European conquest was brutal. The history of Spanish conquest was brutal. I mean, Cortez landing in Mexico and basically wiping out the Aztec, right? Pizarro going to Peru and, and killing the Incas, yada, yada, yada. I mean, there's, there's no... So here's... That leads me into this next question. Um, what solutions would you like to see implemented to heal the ancestral trauma minority groups suffered, not only throughout the country, but even right here in Taos? Um, I'm going to give you these things you can take with you and read. Okay. Um, I basically would like to see an end to the capitalist system, to the economic system that runs this country that runs the entire planet. It is so um, racist, it is so, it's predicated on inequality. Capital, I don't think capitalism has very much to do with democracy at all. Democracy is a very different ideal. The economic system is just predicated on competition, people against each other, it's predicated on inequality. I think Malcolm X once said that this capitalism is racism. It depends on having, our economic system depends on having 80 or 90 percent of the population poor and the 1 percent at the top 
the Jeff Bezos, the Amazons, the Chase Manhattan, uh, I mean the JP Morgan Chase, the Citibanks, Deutsche Banks in Germany, I mean the people who are running the world, right? It's the, um, and um, I would like to see unity. I was thinking about the statues, you know, everybody fighting about tearing down Juan de Oñate and tearing down the Civil War statues and all that kind of stuff. I would like, I'd say, well, tear them all down. You know, just, just to keep, it's the point of the people ruling the world to keep the 99% fighting each other. You know, to keep the 99, to keep the, 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 the Pueblo and the Acroma and the Laguna people fighting the Hispanic, you know, the conquistadors that came in or the Mexicans that came in afterwards. I also know that, you know, that, that Apache and, and, and uh, Navajo and Ute tribal people, they had fights also. They, 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 they kidnapped, you know, people who mm -hmm. held slaves and that kind of stuff. Um, but they didn't, they didn't have the methodology of the Europeans and the, and the Spaniards, you know, that kind of thing. So I would like to see somehow a unity amongst people, you know, amongst native people, Hispanic people, Anglo people, Asian people, Islamic people, um, you know, to join together, to be together, because um, black people aren't going to be able to do it alone. Hispanic people aren't going to be able to do it alone. Native people aren't going to be able to do it alone. Right? We, we have to join together and somehow figure out how not to fall in the constant trap of fighting each other. As long as we're fighting each other, Trump wins. And Word. I like those strong words, Mr. Nichols, strong words. Now, you mentioned about the, the statues coming down. Yeah. Uh, that's also something we wanted to talk to you about as well. Because, uh -huh. I mean, across the United States, groups are calling for the removals of those statues depicting certain historical figures. Right. Uh, Juan de Oñate and others in, in our own home state here have fallen into those crosshairs as well. Now, you've already kind of touched on it and you mentioned, you know, you know, the heck with it, let's just bring them all down. So. What approach to these demands do you feel is the best route with everybody's intentions? What, what approach to what? Well, what what approach to these demands do you feel is the best route to take to, you know, like you said, to create that unity? Um, yeah, it, it's uh, the approach that I guess I would take, and I have. My family is really mixed. My son-in-law is African American, so my granddaughters in Albuquerque are part African American. They're out on the streets every night, right, um, demonstrating. Um, when I got out of college, I was completely ignorant. I had gone to a prep school and then I went to a private college back east and I realized I went um, right after I got out of college I, I went to visit a friend in Guatemala and I had never seen so much misery in my life and poverty and cruelty, you know, people who deliberately maimed themselves in order to beg. beg. The only thing a woman could do was to be a prostitute in Guatemala in that time. It was the satrapy of the United States. The United States had put it, the CIA had helped to put in a dictator in 1964, Castillo Armas, and maintained dictatorships all the way till 1998, supported by the United States, 
All our bananas came from Guatemala, from the United Fruit Company, etc. And uh, it just blew my head off to see, it disillusioned me totally about the United States. Just how horrible we treated, you know, so we were so-called democratic, altruistic country, just how horrible we were treating this country. And I came back to America and I started just to reteach myself from scratch, to read books. I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I don't have any kind of religious bent. You know, I wasn't into the Black Muslims or Elijah Muhammad, but that book inspired me of this person who was kind of a gangster as a kid goes to prison and he starts to read and to learn how the world works. Right? And I started to read. I would like to see my granddaughters, you know, I'd like to see them start to read and go to study groups and stuff like that and understand how the, what the wider picture is that creates racism that creates these conflicts, right? Because it's not just an accident and there's reasons for it. And I read, you know, I mentioned I read Malcolm X, I read Ida Tarbell on the history of Standard Oil, I read um, Claude Brown, you know, I read P.D. Thomas on Down These Mean Streets, I read D. Brown, bury my heart at wounded knee, you know, I started reading Native American history, which I knew nothing about. Um, uh, you know, Sand Creek Massacre, and yada, 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 and, 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 uh, uh, and I think that learning to use this anger, you know, to learn um, about the history of it and how it has been and how it has worked and to learn about, again, the finances behind it. I mean, slavery didn't just happen because white people hate black people. Slavery was economic, you know. The Civil War was economic because the North certainly had a lot of slave laborers, you know, that were just killing themselves in factories for no money at all. But the South was richer because it had, it had workers that weren't getting paid anything, right? right? And it also had a warmer climate. It could do cotton and stuff like that, which was worldwide important. Um, I guess, you know, I'm trying to think of what books could I recommend for people to read? I gave my granddaughters a real short book by Walter Mosley, uh, African-American mystery writer, best known for Devil in the Blue Dress. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a little book called Working on the Chain Gang, which describes how everybody, not just black people, are victims you know, in the working world for, you know. I always tell people racism is a tool used by a capitalist society to maintain class divisions for economic reasons, you know. And racism isn't just against black people, it's against Native American people, it's against Hispanic people, it's against women, you know, the misogyny that keeps women only earning $70, 70 cents compared to every dollar a male person can earn in the same job, right? right, right. There's racism against women, racism against LBGTQ, racism um, uh, in, in many forms that justify exploitation of people's labor. Northern Ireland, 
the, the Protestants are Anglos and the Catholics are Anglos. But all the racism is, is against, you know, major against Catholics who do all the shit work. You know. Alrighty. Um, so I have uh, just two more questions left for you. Because uh, a lot of the, we've answered a lot of it already, you know, in terms of like, uh, you know, the removal of the statues and stuff. Um, they want to, some groups in Taos have uh, called for the removal of Kit Carson's name from the public park. Always, yeah. Uh, so some folks are calling for the removal of Padre Martinez's statue right. from the plaza. Do um, you have any thoughts to share with the community on, on those two particular uh, monikers? I think if the entire community wanted to change it, then then they should change it. I think if there's just a coterie of radical 10 people who want to change the names or bring down the statues, that that's pretty invalid. You know, if the entire, I mean, if the Pueblo and the people outside the Pueblo and the county want to do that, then, um, then do it, you know. But try and do it together. Right. You know, try and do it together. Do not just pit one group against another group. And I, I, I don't really know how you do that other than in some of the education I've been talking about where people develop a more macroscopic overview of the situation, of how the situation really works and right. how essentially, you know, we're all enslaved by, by this, the people at the top, by this, the organized, privatized, you know, global capitalist system on top, that as long as it can keep us fighting each other, they, 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 they get to make huge profits off our labor. And, and to somehow encourage the people of Taos to feel that we're all together, that we're, we're not all enemies. Right, that brings me to my last question. What steps does Taos need to take to protect its most unique quality, our cultural diversity? Is to protect that cultural diversity is to, I don't know, I spend a lot of time like fighting for the acequia system yeah. as a commissioner and all this kind of stuff, etc. Yada, yada, yada. Um, so I mean, I'm in worried, terms of like, you know, like how the rest of the country is te basically tearing itself apart right now. Yeah, it's tearing itself How do we keep that from happening to us? Um, how do we keep that from uh, we talk about breaking down the, uh, the economies, the economic system, because we both know that it's based off of what it's based off yeah, of, right? And, it's, yeah. and we've talked about um, education, you know, preserving history through learning, yeah. you know, as opposed to iconalizing. And, um, you know, those can, those can leave a, a those can leave a community pretty divided. Yes, no. So everybody is pretty divided. Yeah. And even when things are going smoothly underneath people, there, there's a lot of division going on. Yeah. Um, I remember when e electricity went into the Pueblo, the, the battle over electricity going into the Pueblo. And I actually wrote one book called The Magic Journey, which deals with with that, it deals with just um, changing a town from a unified, self-sustaining community to a, a community run on cash where everybody's divided and uh, the, the big shots have kind of taken over the, the money. And I remember talking to a lot of people at the Pueblo about the electricity coming in and 
many people were just terrified it would ruin the culture. And to a certain degree, it certainly has affected, I mean, I'm a guy who can get up at, you know, midnight and go to a bathroom. And I certainly had a lot of sympathy for people, you know, 80-year-old ladies who had to go down three ladders and go around to an outhouse, you know, when, when people were living in the main apartments. Right. And uh, so electricity was very meaningful in many ways, right? But it also meant that kids at the Pueblo were being babysat by the TV set instead of their, their grandparents. And I don't know what moves have been made to protect the language, you know, that, that kind of thing. I don't know whether there's still a continuity in the Kiva um, amongst, you know, young people. Uh, and uh, so I do I believe real strongly in protecting language, you know, which is the heart of a culture. And that would mean Tiwa, and it would mean Spanish, and, you know, we got English. Um, but how do we avoid it, I guess? We avoid it by trying to spread the word that we're all in it together, that, that we need to, you know, there's a slogan, what was it, united we stand, divided we fall. That, that was a U.S. slogan, yeah. but it's a good slogan, you know, just struggle, what voices that can struggle to stay stay united and in every way we can and I understand that the economic system and everything else is working against that you know and with your voice if, if you're having these chautauquas with, with different people you know with Carpio and, and, and uh, you know his daughter Carl? Yeah. Yeah. I remember when she was a great slam poet. I remember that. She was one of my students at one point. But really? Yeah. And yeah. She's I, up I, in Colorado now or something? I forget. Well, I, I seen her at the John Dunn Bridge yesterday. Oh, really? So, yeah, I seen oh. her down there. And cool. um, she's, I believe she's still working around here. Mm. Um, I, I don't, I don't uh, associate myself with her too much these days. Right, I don't know. Uh, cause, just because my life is a different direction, you know? Right. But um, well, a little bit about me, you know, I I, um, I met Ann and Peter Abbott right. when I was in the seventh grade. Oh, really? And ever since then, I, I, they took me under their wing. Uh-huh. And I've been writing underneath them until about, ooh, about three, two years ago uh -huh. when I re-enrolled into college and I had the opportunity to reintroduce myself to, to Bill. Oh, really? And uh, since then, he, he's taken me under his wing. Really? So, yeah. yeah that's what I've been doing so do far. Do you have a, um, a blog or anything that you do? No, no, I, I used I, to run I think the... Uh, Bill still does a blog. Right? Yeah, he does. I, I used to run the, uh, the Taos Pueblo news page. Oh, really? Uh, on their social media. But um, because my dad is a governor, right. I put it on hiatus. Because uh -huh. I didn't want anybody to think that I was being biased or anything like oh, that really? with him. How old are you now? Thirty-nine. 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 Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you could see my face, you'd probably recognize me because I was in all the slams and stuff. I went undefeated oh, for two years. Well, we, we can look at each when, other's faces. <laughs> when when Nave was uh oh right when Nave was running the slams there at the Bean. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was my really? that stomping grounds there. Wow. And then, uh, again, like I said, you know, I, I was Anne and Peter's protege for quite some time. Really? Are you, I, you're going to talk to Lila Johnston? I'm hoping. She hasn't returned my phone calls yet. 
is she in Albuquerque now or something? She was running for Congress? She was or? in Santa Fe last I checked. Oh, really? But I still keep close ties with her on Facebook and all that. But uh -huh. I think maybe she feels like, I think she hasn't responded because she probably feels like she's not a resident. Yeah. So she shouldn't be involved in the talk, but I don't know yet. I have to hear from her still. She should be. I mean, we're all residents. Of, yeah. We're all residents on the planet, you know. We're, I mean, um, who's the, the poet shit? I get a lot of brain farts now. Um, I know why the caged bird, Angelou. Maya Angelou, yeah, Maya. Angelou. I just remember a little line in one of her poems just saying, we are more alike to each other than we are different from each other. And uh, there's really only one community. And that's all of us on the world. I mean, that's, that people often ask me, how did I get familiar enough with Taos to write, I don't know, Milagro Mingfio or yeah. after I'd only been here for two or three years, right? And my reply is always, well, most of it's universal. You know, these people, the archetypes of the same situations exist in northern New Hampshire or rural Virginia or, you know, you know, Arizona. when I read the book, I could almost vision every place the book took you. And when I watched the movie, yeah. I was like, this has got to be like Greece or Spain or somewhere yeah. like that. You know, yeah. this could be any country in the world right. with, yeah. with a little Taos in it, yeah. you know. And so, yeah, I, I can I can understand your wanting for things to become a little bit more universal yeah this is going to sound funny but you know we're probably never ever going to find intel intelligent life off this planet until we can act as one global community until we get intelligent <laughs> right exactly <laughs> intelligent enough to to move as one global unit you know right Right on, Mr. Nichols. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. All right. This has yeah. been great, man. Yeah, it's been really pleasant to meet you and, and talk to you. Yeah. Any, any last, you the, uh, any last words for stuff. the community before... Uh, Excuse me? Any last words for the community? Um, hasta la victoria siempre. <laughs> All right.